Hello and welcome back to the studio. I'm joined now by Tim Wolf from uh, ITRON, Director of Marketing Communications. Um, and Tim, firstly, welcome. Uh, thank you for making the time to be with us in the studio. Thank you. Long time no talk, Long Adam. Long time no talk, I know. Well, uh, 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 Tim and I have been bumping into each other throughout this uh, uh, conference. and uh, so. We're talking a little bit off air, and one of the things that I, I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you've launched a new product set. You, you know, the, the, there's some new announcement, new innovations coming through from Itron, and um, obviously, I'll let you talk about them a little bit. Otherwise, you can't answer my real question. And my real question is this: What were your customers saying, doing, and telling you that made you? do what you've done? Ah. So that's like three questions in one. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, in, in some cases, I'd, I'd say it was things that our utility customers globally were experiencing and, and, then, and then talking about. But uh, uh, just for the, the background at European Utility Week here, we've rolled out uh, technology we call ITRON Riva and embedding that ITRON Riva technology in our open way network. And one of the uh, problems we're really addressing there that our customers experience is that when you deploy a smart metering or smart grid communication network, the first 85 or 90 percent of the areas and the endpoints that you want to connect to are fairly easy and not too costly and they go fairly fast. But when you reach that last 10 percent of the deployment, you have to address the the hard to reach meters and the diff difficult locations in the service territory, the costs and the headaches go through the roof. And so, so that's these are, these one are, immediate problem yeah. that we were trying to solve with Riva yeah. technology. So these are remote meters, I, I live in a remote ro location or, uh, or, or, or someone put my meter in a crazy place in the house and, uh, and things like that. Uh, and it, it, does that become a disproportionate cost then for customers, that, that, that last 10%? Extremely disproportionate. Mm. And, uh, and, and there's a number of areas there which, which present challenges. And you know, so often thus far the discussion uh, w with our utility customers and other vendors is what one communication technology should we select and what is most appropriate for most of the service territory and then they end up struggling through the rest. And some examples there are meters in remote lo locations a long way away from other infrastructure where it's difficult to connect to them. Uh, some of the more common problems we see are in uh, uh, highly populated, dense urban areas where there's lots of high rises, residential buildings, apartments, condominiums that go way up in the air above where RF wireless signals propagate you know, easily and properly. So uh, you know, lots of concrete, dense urban environments, lower density rural environments, all these, all these places create real challenges add cost to deployment of these networks. And that's probably one of the first problems we're, we were looking to solve for our customers. So let's, let's stick to one use case, which, uh, which may be so uh, uh, whacking great big high rise, meter right on the, uh, on the top floor. How was that problem being solved? And how are you solving it now, almost? Well, if, if you have a single communication solution and say it's RF wireless, well, you would have to reach all the way up to the meters in the top of that building. So you'd have to build relays up? up relays, those. mitigation devices that uh, boost the signal. We call them range extenders. There's other names for them. But the bottom line is more and more costly network infrastructure. Often these high-rise buildings will also have meters down three, four, five stories below grade in concrete rooms, which is an extremely tough environment. So the idea is uh, really to combine power line carrier communications to get down from the top of the building, but then be able to hop on an RF link, a wireless link, and gain the efficiencies there once it's in a more suitable area. So we, one of the initial purposes of ITRON Revo was to was to offer and bring to market a communication technology 
that can self-optimize based on location, based on topology, based on the nature and application of the data. And to do that, we had to put some more intelligence out to the edge of the network to enable that to happen. And that's what Reva's all about. That sounds incredibly cool. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a few questions about how, how, the, uh, how all of that works. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so it, it, it self-optimizes, uh, so again, forgive me if this is too basic uh, uh, thing, so uh, you, you'd, you'd, go, uh, you'd go in, uh, you'd put in this technology and it would itself say, hang on, I'm not communicating well enough, so I'm going to boost my own range and things like that, or, or is there still a need for some extra sort of hardwired infrastructure and things like that? Well, yeah, yes, there, there, there are wireless connectors and, and, and routers. In our case, that's a, that's a Cisco product for our open way network, the Cisco connected grid router. That serves as a data collection endpoint. Um, oftentimes with a PLC only solution, it's necessary to deploy that PLC communications infrastructure at every transformer. But if we have an RF option in there where the data or the signal can hop onto an RF link around a transformer and, and go to the next, next uh, node in the network, it's no longer necessary to have all that PLC infrastructure. Right. So at the end of the day, we see uh, minimal infrastructure required to assure connectivity when we have this dynamic adaptive communications that integrates two communications technologies on the same chipset and we can offer that at a, at a price that's competitive with other offerings on the market. And when we started off earlier, you, you explained the business pain. You said, okay, the last 10% can have disproportionate costs. Yes. So someone somewhere within iTron, I would imagine, has done some number crunching and say, well, if at the moment the last 10% costs $100, we can do the last ten percent for I don't know fifty, twenty, whatever. Do you, do you have any of the uh, any of that information? Yeah, well, it's it's. Or is that it's, too general? It's it's very diverse in terms of depending on the the service territory, what sorts of challenges a utility is facing. What we project out is is cost of ownership over the life of the system. So as you're going as a utility is deploying a network. What are they going to have to do in that last 10% to achieve reliable connectivity with all the endpoint devices? What are they going to have to do to maintain that network over the life of the system, whether that's 10, 15 years, whatever the case may be? And then what is the cost of adding on new applications and devices? And that goes to the whole architecture of the network, right. getting back to the, the OpenWay IPv6 story with right. Cisco. Okay. So we're, we're looking at a very broad cost analysis there that really is best expressed in cost of ownership over the life of the system. And we believe this, this yields a, a significant advantage there. Okay. And um, so m moving the conversation on a, l a little bit, and we were talking a little bit off air and I was sharing, you know, some of the macro themes that are coming out with people in the hot seat like yourself. Yes. And um, one of the ones that, uh, uh, kind of started off last year and hasn't stopped uh, is uh, this uh, ITOT integration or the digital utility or call it what you will. Yes. Um, from a customer perspective, are you getting that request in from your customers, uh, the utilities saying, listen, this is what we would like to do. We want to integrate these two systems. Is, is that a, is that a, a real-world request? Uh, yes, that, that is the, the entire theme, the backdrop of smart grid. And so that, that implies two or three core capabilities there in terms of integrating information technology with operational technology. And, and that's certainly being done in, in other industries, but what we're seeing that's a particular challenge in, in the utility industry is that we're talking about information technology to drive the operation of critical infrastructure on a very large scale where total reliability is a requirement. And that's a new challenge in terms of depth and scale. And, and being that bulletproof is, is what yes. really is the, the driving the complexity. And so when the utility 
has integrated its IT with its OT uh, mm -hmm. and so on, and, and I know there are some that have done it, but what I f find is lacking is, is some sort of clear identification of, okay, what does that do for that particular business, mm -hmm. and what can it do? Mm -hmm. You know, because you don't put stuff like this in without realizing an immediate, uh, something immediate, fixing something immediate, mm -hmm. but also yes. for the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you guys seeing in that? Well, I, I think there's a couple of capabilities out in the network, out in the distribution system, that really open up possibilities in, in some key areas that are pain points for utilities. First of all, I, I think we all know that uh, the, the smart grid, smart metering systems create a lot of data that has value. And realizing the value of that data is one of our key challenges in the industry right now. Uh, at ITRON, we would argue that creating value out of that data in the right place is an even more precise need. And what I mean by that is, is we need networks and solutions where we can do data processing analysis in the right place, whether that's out at the edge of the network, in the meter, the grid device, the sensor, whether it's in the network itself, or whether it's in the utility back office. So that's moving that decision making to the edge? Or to where it's best, the, the decision it's making right. is best made. But increasingly, that will be at the edge because one of the things the smart grid will enable is more timely, better decision making based on real data. And, and the, other, the other sort of attribute that uh, we really need to put in place by moving intelligence is to the edge is the ability of grid devices to communicate and interoperate. And to this point, meters are meters, distribution automation is distribution automation, load control is load control. They all sort of do their thing, speak their own language, but in technologies such as ITRON Riva, we're putting enough processing power and horsepower in there where those devices, whether it's a meter, whether it's a grid sensor, whether it's a piece of distribution automation equipment, can speak the language of other devices. Not just a metering protocol, it can also host a protocol that allows it to speak DNP3 to a distribution um, automation device or, or other protocols to load control. So we're starting to see the ability for devices to analyze and make decisions within parameters and programming out on the edge to take action in response to changing grid conditions. And that's always what we've envisioned the smart grid would be. And uh, it it seems to have taken us until now to maybe get all the tech in place to to fully do that. And one of the things I wanted to, to talk just a little bit about, and I know we discussed this in detail in the webinar we did, uh, and so on. But uh, you know, kind of one of the questions that came out, uh, which I think would be quite nice to finish up on, is you mentioned it. You know, the the para parameters uh, uh, at which these devices can take autonomous decisions. Yes. Uh, you know, how is that in there? And also, again, it was highlighted much more in the webinar we did, uh, is uh, about that uh, sort of learning and artificial intelligence part, you know, mm -hmm. because that's quite interesting as well, because these things don't just make decisions, they also learn and mm -hmm. continue to adapt. If I can just let you finish off on, the, on that side of things. <laughs> Just to give you the last question. <laughs> well, when, 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 we, when we have that kind of processing power in the edge, um, it creates a lot of new possibilities. We look at applications such as uh, energy diversion detection and really looking at actual electric current flow to determine where that, where that is happening, right. what type of diversion it is, when it's taking place, as opposed to hauling a whole bunch of disparate data back to the back office and doing analysis there. We, we, we see real possibilities to identify that virtually in real time in the field and target utility action and field invest investigation accordingly. We see real opportunities to improve outage detection and response through the ability of, a, uh, of edge intelligence to enable meters and devices to ask other devices in the, in the neighborhood, hey, are you on? Do you have power? 
and depending on the answer there, make some very quick calculations and determinations of where that outage is, it's it, where where it's taking place, and what the cause is. Uh, similarly, and whether it's localized loading. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so these use cases where there is intelligence out on the edge of the network really be, need to be proved out, evaluated, worked by you know both the technology community and our utility customers to discover where the real value is. But. That, that that intelligence on the edge is going to change the way we operate on the grid. And it strikes me that the, this puts us one step closer to this notion of the self-healing grid. So yes. I would imagine that in certain instances, not all the time, you know, if the, if the pole's gone down, the pole's gone down, the machines can't suddenly, well, maybe they can one day, but not at the moment. But in certain instances, they, they could just say, right, okay, actually, in order to fix this outage, we just need to switch you on and you off and route it around that way and then we've done it. And that can save, I would imagine, a heck of a lot of money because you can then send the maintenance crew around maybe in a week's time when it's more optimal and stuff like that. Yes, yeah. and, and, and not that utilities haven't been doing intelligent switching for some time, mm. but now we're talking about an integrated converged network where different devices are contributing information and data to that calculation. So we're talking about more timely, more precise operations at the edge, and also taking place on a single network infrastructure, running multiple applications in concert with each other. And that's the change, instead of having different networks deployed for, for different grid applications. Perfect, and we'll leave it at that. And uh, thank you as well for watching, Tim. Thanks again for making the time to be in the studio. Uh, allows you to sit down for a bit, I suppose, if, there, if there's uh, any other benefit to it. And uh, yeah, thanks again. And I mentioned the webinar we did with iTron. That's available on Ngerati as well. So if you want to go ahead and watch that, please do so. Thanks again. Thank you, Adam. Always Thank a you. pleasure to talk yeah. to you.